okay. Turn with me in your, in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. There's no no need to stay in usher. You may be you may be seated. I'm not going to read and reread. We got 20 verses, and instead of reading it and then turn around and rereading it, because I have to touch on each and every verse. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, there is 40 verses in this unit of thought. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we're going to start with verse 1. We're going to take the first 20 verses today. Next week, we're going to take the, the last 20 verses. I'm going to break it up into two sermons for the sake of time. It would take me probably three or four hours to preach the totality of 40 verses so instead of reading and rereading we're just going to uh, have our prayer time and then we're just going to jump right in the text and I'll read it as we go amen amen, amen. let us pray father God we thank you now for yet another opportunity to be in this number we thank you now for our early rise this morning we thank you for your grace and your mercy your love for us we come now as we acknowledge you as being the head of the church, the, the head of our lives. You are the creator, you're the author and the finisher of our faith. You're Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Father, we recognize you as being sovereign and being in total control. And Father, now as we come now to the point of the service where we break the bread of life, I pray now that you will lift me up into your storehouse of wisdom, that you will anoint me from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. You will give me preaching power from on high that I can preach this sermon with power and with clarity. Like John said, let me now decrease while you increase, that they're always here from you and never from me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you. And as we begin our text, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 20, uh, this morning, and we've been using the subject, Charismatic Chaos, uh, sermon number 4, or uh, Counterfeit Gifts, part 1. This is part 1 and a part 2. And I believe that this is the most misunderstood text in all of Scripture. This text on tongues, speaking in tongues, is it valid in the 21st century? We realize in the first century, all the gifts were valid. But in the 21st century, is tongues valid? Satan is the master imitator. He imitates only that which is important. Have you ever seen anybody imitate a penny? Every, uh, a nickel? You know, dollar bill. It has to be of, of some importance, like Louis Vuitton and Dooney and, and, and Burke. They're going to imitate something of, of, of value. You got the Trinity. You got the unholy Trinity. You got the devil, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. It's the anti God against God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So he is an imitator of gifts. We have been talking over the past several weeks as we've been studying the subject of tongues. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14. You can't understand chapter 14 unless you first understand chapter 12 and chapter 13, the gift, the control of the gifts, and chapter 14, which we will look at in two parts, is the misuse of the gifts. We look at the book of 1 Corinthians. It is a book of castigating, condemning, and correcting the church at Corinth for their conduct in the church. This was a messed up, mixed up church, but nonetheless they were all believers. They were jacked up, tore up from the flow up, but yet they still was believers. Paul said they come behind in no gift. Chapter 12 talks about the confusion. Chapter 13, the correction. In chapter 14, it talks about the comparison. There's, there's five things, there's five points. In this sermon, we're going to look at the first two. First of all, I want us to notice the subordination of tongues revealed. The second thing is the substance of tongues recorded. And next week, we'll look at the sign of tongues revealed. Fourthly, the speaking in tongues regulated. Fifthly, is the standard of tongues that are required. But notice point number one, 
as we begin our journey, the subordination of tongues that is revealed in verses 1 through 12. Notice, first of all, the priority there in verse 1. Verse 1 says, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. Now, look at that word gifts. The word gift is italicized. That means that the word gifts is not in the Septuagint. That's the original Greek and Hebrew Bible. King James added that word there for our personal understanding. But it reads, follow after charity, a love, and desire spiritual. The gifts is added there. But notice the priority that is cited there. Now, they were pursuing after love. When you go back to chapter 12, verse 31, and just allow me to go back and, and read that. It says, but covet earnestly the best gifts and yet show you I a more excellent way. So Paul here is saying that they are to, instead of pursuing gifts, they are to pursue love. There's nothing wrong with setting your heart on spiritual gifts. Because we know that when we're saved, the Holy Spirit is the one that has given us the gift that he wants us to have. So it's nothing wrong with setting your heart on spiritual gifts. But the highest gift is that of speaking the message of God. The highest gift is is prophecy. That's the great commission. God has commanded that we go into the world and preach the gospel. Romans chapter 1 verse 16, 17, Paul says that it's the power unto salvation. The word of God has the power to transform lives. It saddens me and and I'm ashamed to say that many pastors have watered down the word. They're no longer preaching the word of God. They would take a census and they would say to the church, what is it that you want uh, uh, that you want to hear from the pulpit? It should be that determination of the Holy Spirit that has given the preacher as to what he ought to say based on the needs of the people in the congregation. God is the one that directs to me as to what it is I need to preach on Sunday morning. It is not my choice. It is God's choice. But they've watered down the word. They've done it down the word in order to appease the people. Most pastors and preachers just want to preach a word that they can get amen. Most of them preach for amen. I don't preach for amen. I don't preach for hand clap. I simply just preach the word of God because that's what's required uh, of me. But the greatest gift of all is that gift of, of prophecy because it edifies the whole body. Any gift that is given, it is given for the edification of the totality of the body of Christ. Amen. No gift is given for your own personal benefit. The churches were chasing after tongues. Now, they all were, were chasing after tongues, but, but the reason why tongues is not profitable in the church, because when you speak in an unintelligible language, it does not edify the body of Christ, because no one can understand what you are, are saying. Many folks today, they want to speak in tongues. They want to just look spiritual. They want to jump across the stage, and they, they want to seem like they got a special gift, because you you don't speak in tongues and I don't speak in tongues that they got a special spiritual authority over us because they can speak in some uh, uh, unintelligible language which they say well I'm speaking in some unholy language when you get into this Pentecostal uh, movement they simply will say that you have to speak in tongues as as an evidence of salvation let me read a verse of scripture to you. Don't turn to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 29. And it says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret. That simply means it's in the negative. God did not give everybody the gift of speaking in tongues. Now, the Pentecostal movement says that everyone has to speak in tongues as an evidence of their salvation. But the Bible says that everyone was not given the gift of speaking in tongues. That's what the word says. Yeah. Now, and they say that maybe it's a, a second blessing. And some folks say, well, I got saved at eight, but I received the power of the Holy Spirit when I was 24. Now, how is that possible? 
there is some kind of baptismal power, a baptismal uh, uh, regeneration of some sort that they have, they can get saved, and then later down the road, they can receive the Holy Spirit. The last time I checked, when you say yes to Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit, and then you're baptized as evidence of what has already taken place on the inside. you just making a public declaration to say, I'm dying to self, and I'm being raised in the newness of life. Now, there's two ways of, when they say the evidence of, of speaking in tongues. Now, I've read the Bible, and uh, I'm not to have the total authority God does, but there's only two places in the Bible that gives us the uh, evidence of salvation. Number one, in, first, in Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14, it said it's the earnest down payment. The Holy Spirit is the earnest down payment that we will spend the rest of our life in eternity with the Lord. And also in Ephesians 2 text says that we are workmen. And when we're saved, it ought to be the evidence of works. What we do in life is the evidence that we are saved. It says nothing about speaking in tongue to be an evidence of salvation when everyone is not given the gift of speaking in tongues. So God is the one they make the determination as what gift you get. So the pastor can't not say you need to speak in tongues because maybe God wasn't didn't give you that specific gift of speaking in tongues. We dumb it down the word. Speaking in tongues, the unintelligible speech, is not edifying the body as, uh, as a whole. You can go back to Acts chapter 2, 10 and 19. You know, when Peter preached at Pentecost, he preached in what is called delectos. He preached in a language. You cannot compare uh, Acts chapter 2 to what we find in 21st century church. When Peter preached, they said we hear in our own language. And because the hearing of the word, 3,000 folks were saved because they heard and they understood what was being said, and they came to know Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord. That's the true definition of, of tongues and tongues talking, but that is not what we find in the 21st century church, but not only the priority cited, but notice the purpose characterized there in verse 2 and 3, and it's for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue. Now notice now, let me stop here and, and digress for a moment. Now, this is the problem with different versions of the Bible. If anybody in here has a Bible other than the King James, your Bible probably really reads, for he that speaketh in a tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understands him. How be it in the spirit he speaketh a mystery, but he that prophesied speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. But notice that word unknown. It is also italicized. That word is not in the original Septuagint. King James added that verse, that word in that verse to let us know that this tongue is unknown. And notice as we get down into the, to the text, it says, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, that word tongue there is plural, is singular, excuse me, but when Paul speaks, it's plural. But the word unknown there is simply saying that it's an unknown. Paul, as, as King James is writing, he's simply saying, that, listen, and Paul said that this is an unknown language. They are speaking in a, in a language that no one can understand. So he puts unknown to give us uh, a better understanding. In the, in the text in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says that as they came into the church, he said you were carried away by dumb idols. And what happened was the Corinthians, as they were lost, and as they was in their pagan Gentile days before conversion, they were at the feet of Diana, and they were sitting there, and they were... Uh, having orgies, they were frothing at the mouth under the control of Satan, and they were speaking in ecstatic utterances in a language that no one could understand. In other words, what they were doing was they were detaching their minds from their body, and their mind was being controlled by demons, and they were speaking in the language of the demons. If you ever seen or watch some of the shows and see them, how the charismatic movement, how they're speaking in unecstatic utterances, and they're running around in the church, it almost seemed like they are demon possessed. 
They said, as they came into the church at Corinth, they saw the apostles, they saw them speaking in dialectos and tongues and languages, and they said, oh, we can do that too. So what they did was they brought their pagan uh, uh, belief into the church that's no different than what we do today. When we have rapping in the church, in other words, when I was lost and I was a rapper, now that I've gotten saved, I've gotten into the church and I hear the songs being sang. And you know what? I can do that too. And I'm going to bring rap into the church. I'm going to take my pagan roots and bring them into the church. It's no different than what we're doing today. They're simply saying, that, listen, I can do that too. I'm just as spiritual as you boys are. I can speak in a language also, but my language is unintelligible. It's un understandable, but I'm going to make up the excuse that I'm speaking in some holy language of the angels, and I never heard the angels speak in anything but, uh, but the, the uh, English this uh, language of men, which is that which is understandable. But the purpose characterized tongues do not enlighten the church as a whole without understanding it profiteth nothing. If I stand up here and I begin to speak in German, that, 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 you know, that, you know, nobody's going to understand what I'm saying. Or if I speak in French or Russian or Japanese or Chinese or whatever it may be. There is no understanding of what I'm saying. Therefore, the church cannot be edified if the church cannot understand what is being said. But notice the problem of tongues. First of all, it's unintelligible language and it benefits nobody. Maybe he's speaking in the mystery, in the spirit, and that's what they say. Well, how be it? Maybe I'm speaking in some angelic uh, language. I'm speaking in a holy language, and I'm speaking unto God. But as for the body of Christ, what you're saying is unintelligible, and no one can understand it. Therefore, it is not profitable to the body because no one can understand. Here lies the problem with tongues, but notice the purpose of prophecy. Prophecy is to build up the body of Christ. The word has power to transform lives and it confronts, it convicts, but the preaching of, of the word. That is what we're called to do. That is what we do every Sunday morning and Wednesday night. We preach the word of God in a way that is understandable for everyone that hear it because it says faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God, I've got to be able to hear, to understand, for my faith to grow. It does no purpose for me to stand and speak in another language that you don't understand, that you cannot be edified. Amen. Now, as we get into the text, I don't understand how in the world get a Pentecostal movement misunderstand what Paul is saying. There's no way, shape, or form that Paul is condoning speaking in another language. But not only the priority cited, the purpose characterized, but notice the preference there commended there in verse 4 and 5. Notice it says, and he that speaks in, and listen, in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesies edifies the church. I would that ye all speak, speak with, notice the word, their tongues is plural. There is no unknown. This word is delectosh. The word unknown is the word glossolalia, which means unintelligent speech. So Paul says, I would that ye all speak with delectosh, tongues or languages, but rather that you prophesy, for greater is he that prophes that prophesy than he that speaketh in tongues except he interpret and the church may receive edification i think it's very clear paul makes it crystal clear that if you're going to speak in tongues there need to be some type of interpretation therefore the church can be edified it's real. It's unreal to God. They only bring glory to themselves. What is done in a local church should be done to profit with all. That means to profit everyone. 
Now, if I, whatever the gift that is given to each and every one of us, it is for the totality of the body of Christ. It is not for your own individual use. It profit God nothing if the body is not edified by the gift. Now, keep in mind, God is the one that gives us the gift that he wants us to have. So I can't come into church and desire a gift. It is the gift that is given to me. So they, they, they all wanted to, to speak in, in tongues. And now Paul gives the, the corrective letter here. But notice three things. First of all, there's the pride. There's the ego building. Look at me uh, as they speak in unecstatic utterances. And nobody understands what they're saying. It's like an ego builder. It's like I'm a little bit better than you. I'm a little bit more spiritual than you because I can speak in an unknown tongue and you can't. If they want to say that, it's the evidence of speaking in tongue, but not only the pride, but it says the prophecy. He said, I would rather you all speak with languages, but not all gifts are given to one person. So everybody does not have the gift of speaking in tongues. Or the gift of interpretation. It said not all are prophets. Not all do miracles. God has selected the gift. So the Pentecostal movement has run amok. Because everyone that gets saved. You can't bring them down to the altar. And tell them to repeat these words. Okay say them faster. Say them faster. Say them faster. Or give them a class on speaking in tongues. If it's a gift. God has given you the gift, and there's no reason for you to learn how to utilize the gift. If God has given you the gift, and that gift is to be used for the body of Christ. Notice the pride, the prophecy, but the prerequisite there. And it says that you interpret what you are saying. Now, if it's going to be legitimate, tongues talking, there has to be an interpretation. So whatever is said in tongues... There has to be someone to interpret what is saying for the edification of the body. And usually it's the person that is doing the speaking is the one that can interpret what is being said. But nonetheless, someone in that body has to interpret what is being said for it to be legitimate tongues. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been in the church now going on about 18 years. And I've been watching preaching and never once have I heard anyone speak in tongue and I heard someone interpret. Never. I've seen them run back and forth. Why well, need to buy them back and forth across the, the podium, uh, the stage, and speaking in tongue. And I've never heard no one stop and interpret what she's saying. If it's not interpreted, then it's not for the body, it's not for the edification. And Paul is saying, if that's the case, you need to remain quiet and speak to yourself. Amen. We've looked at the priority cited, the purpose characterized, the preference commended, but I want us to notice also the prophet challenge there in verses 10, verses 6 through 10. Paul here challenged the, the, the benefits of tongue. There must be understanding and communication. See, tongues are useless without interpretation. If it's going to be a legit, legitimate gift, if the gift that is given by God, and God has given you the gift of speaking in tongues, and God has also given someone else in the congregation the gift of interpretations of tongues, so if it's said in tongues, then somebody ought to be there to interpret it. But notice, first of all, the preached word communicated in verse 6, and it says, Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, that word tongue, there's no unknown tongue, this is plural, this is the word delectos, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you, whether in revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophecy, or by doctrine? He's simply saying, if it's profitless, if I speak in a language that you can understand, who can understand a word that they're saying is only beneficial to the body of Christ when it is understood and it is the true revelation of God. And I've even known some people to interpret uh, based on someone speaking tongues and someone standing up and interpret what was saying and it totally wrong. You know, one guy went, Dr. Whitty, he went and he was a the founder of Luther Rice, and I've been told this story several times, that he went to a church and he was fluent in different languages. 
and he spoke in tongues. He simply said uh, in French, and the lady got up and tried to interpret what he said. He said, no, I simply said, your, your, your parking lot has potholes that need to be paid. But he said it in French, but the lady stood for almost 10, 15 minutes trying to give an interpretation of what he said, and he simply spoke in a language that was understandable to those who know how to speak it. But if he was to speak it, he's the one that had the ability also to interpret what he said because he knew the language in which he was speaking. But what we find today in the 21st century is nothing compared to what they did in the first century. It has no value uh, to the church. The, the tongues uh, were used as a sign gift and the scripture says it was for unbelievers. So why is it uh, being spoken in the church? It is saying for unbelievers. There was no canonization of scripture. There was no, no Bible. So signs, miracles, and wonders was done to validate the man of God with the word of God that he is from God because there was no word of God. So the validation was that he can do signs, miracles, and wonders. Now that we have the, the, the Bible, the Bible has been canonized. We have these 66 books. There is no need for signs, miracles, and wonders because if you say something, I can take it, line it up with the Bible, and I can tell whether or not you're a prophet of God because I have the word of God that is in front of me. It's a sign gift, but not only to preach word, communicate, but notice the, the played sound communication there, 7 and 8. But notice the distinctive sound in verse 7. And it says, and even things without life given sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sound. How shall it be known what is pipe or harp? There should be a distinction in sound. Each instrument makes a distinct sound or otherwise, listen, it's a bunch of noise. You know the difference between a symphony when all the instruments are tuned? They're all on the same note. You know, that's what you call a symphony. But if everybody sat down and played what they wanted to play, it's called a cacophony. It's the total opposite of a symphony. So every instrument or everything has a distinct sound. There's the law that are given to music and choirs and, and keys and timing and the conductor rules them all. What if each player went on his own regard and played what he wanted to play? He simply said every instrument has a distinct but yet understandable sound. So this does not sound like he's condoning what they're doing in the church. It sounds to me like he's condemning what they're doing. He's trying to correct what they're doing in the church. He said anything that's unintelligible that you can't understand, listen, has no profit for the church. But notice the definite sound in verse 8. And it says, for if a trumpet gives an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself for the battle? Centuries ago, the commands were given by a trumpet. So if the battle was to begin, and it begins by a trumpet, and the trumpet makes a very distinct sound. There is no other sound like a trumpet. But what happened if it was a clarinet? What happened if it was, you know, a saxophone? But it has to be the distinction of sound to give understanding so they would know what to do. Those that was in the military, every first thing in the morning, dun, 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 wear a peacoat, wear a watch cap. Every, they know what I'm talking about. There is a very distinct sound when that trumpet went off in the morning. You knew exactly what to do. You got up. So what if there was a, a, a saxophone playing? Then you would probably be confused. What am I supposed to do? Because that sound I can't recognize. I don't know what it means. So what am I supposed to do? If I hear a saxophone playing at 6 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to be confused. This is what he's saying. Every instrument has a distinct sound. 
to go into battle, to retreat, to wake up. If the sounds were unclear, then no one would know what to do. This is what's happening in the church at Corinth. Listen, just like language, if there's no clear understanding, it does not profit the hearer. There has to be understanding. Even with instruments, there's understanding. If you are musically inclined, you would be able to listen to a sound and say, okay, that's a trombone, that's a baritone, that's a clarinet, that's a flute, that's a... I mean, you should, because each one has a distinct sound. But what happens if everything sounded the same, there would be no understanding as do we go to battle, do we come back, and what is it we supposed to do because I can't understand the blast of the trumpet because that doesn't sound like a trumpet. So now I'm getting a little bit confused. So he's saying it has to be a distinctive sound and it has to be a definite sound. But not only the preach word communicated, the played sound communication, but notice the, the proclaimed word communicated there in verse 9, 10, and in verse 11. Notice verse 9, it says, So likewise ye accept ye other by the tongue words, easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? Now, that does not appear to me like Paul is saying that, okay, boys, keep on doing what you're doing. For ye shall speak into the air. There are, and it may be so, many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him speaking as a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall not be a barbarian, shall be a barbarian unto to me. He's simply saying that it's pretty clear and it's pretty blunt. Paul here is simply saying there are many languages, but none of them are without understanding. If you go over to the Philippines and you stand there and they may speak, you may not understand it, but those that are around in the Philippines, they understand perfectly what is being said. There's many languages, but they all are understandable. You know, it may not be understandable to you at the moment, but if something is said and you are in, in China and they're speaking in Chinese and someone says something in Chinese and there is an interpreter he's simply going to relate what was said in Chinese into English so you can be edified and know what was being said. That's the whole purpose of speaking in tongue. To me it's pretty it's pretty clear cut it's pretty explainable what Paul here is saying there must be clarity and understanding of the word. He refers to them as barbarians. That means inferior. That you know, he said, listen, if you if you speak in a language that no one understands, it's like being barbaric. I can't understand what you're saying. You can't understand what you're saying. Nobody can understand what you're saying. There has to be uh, the communication, and it has to be understandable. What happens in the church? And in the tongues talking world today, it does not make sense. Does not line up with the word of God. It does not line up with the word at all. It's something that has been man-made. But notice, for the, the pride that's condemned there in verse 12. And it says, even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. You know this Paul keeps talking about edifying. Edifying of the church. That everyone will be edified. He's simply saying that if something is done it ought to be done for the edification of the whole church. Not just for your own personal use. So if it's unrecognizable, uh, it's, it's unreadable or unintelligent, it, it, what, what profit does it, do, does it have for the body of Christ? Their motive and their desire and their gift must be right. It is not for show. They simply want it to be spiritual. They simply want to get up in the front. They want it to be show me gifts. They want it to speak in tongues, prophesy. They want it to be in the front, in the in the limelight. But, I, but we are to seek after love before we seek after a gift. It is not for show, but it's for the edification of the body. They were zealous. They wanted to look spiritual. 
That's all it was. They wanted to look spiritual and they attached themselves to certain gifts. But it is not a desire. We should never desire a gift. We should recognize the gift that God has given us. Amen. So I don't come to church and covet a gift. I just, I just, I just recognize the gift that God has given me. And that's the gift of a prophecy of preaching the word of God. And that's the gift that I use for the edification of the body. And this is what I do every Sunday and Wednesday. Pastor McFarland and the teachers that teach Sunday school. It is for the edification of the body. Amen. Because if you can't understand what is being said, then who can be edified? Who can say amen? Who can say I love the Lord? Who can come to know the Lord as Savior if there's no understanding of what's being said? We're talking, we've looked at the subordination of tongues revealed, but notice point number two. The substance of tongue that is recorded in verses 13 through 18, but notice the prescription for tongues. Uh, prescription for tongues, first of all, notice the principle there in verse 13. And it says, wherefore, let him that speaketh and it notice now, and it says in an unknown tongue, pray that he may interpret. Now there, there we go again. Now this Paul, he's telling them now, if you're going to speak in the in, in Glossolalia in an unknown tongue and ecstatic utterances in this godly goop that we hear today, you need to pray that there's somebody there to interpret what you're saying for the edification of the body. He making it clear in his 14th chapter that is for the edification of the body. It's just common sense. If you speak it, there should be someone who can interpret what you are saying in order that it may be understandable to the church. Let me go back and, and read verse 5. And it says, And I would that you all speak with tongues, but rather that you prophesy, for it is greater than he that prophesy, than he that speak with tongues, except that, that he interprets what is being said, that the church may be edified. Paul said, now, if you've got the gift, and he's talking about 21st, the first century church, and if you got the gift, then there got to be somebody there to, to interpret the gift. But the Bible says once that which is complete has come, that prophecy and, and tongues shall cease in and of itself. In the 21st century, there is no need for tongues. Tongues is not valid in the 21st century church because it is a signed gift and it has ceased and desists all within itself with the completion of the canonization of Scripture. I don't have to be validated as a man of God with the message of God now that we have the word of God. I don't have to do signs, miracles, and wonders to prove who I am. They can just take what I say, line it up with the word of God, and then they can tell whether or not I am a man of God or not. But not only the principle, but notice the problem. And it says in verse 14, then it says, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. That word unfruitful simply means it is useless. He's saying when you pray in the spirit, is what they say. They say, well, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm praying in the spirit. There's like it's some kind of, of, of heavenly language. I'm in the church. I'm just praying in, in, in the spirit. And Paul says, to what end? Question. His spirit prays, but his reasoning is bypassed. Listen, so, so he's speaking and do not understand what he's saying that's unprofitable to the church and to him. Now, there has to be un understanding. Now, he's saying that my mind is being, and my spirit is divorced from, from themselves. So my mind is in neutral and my spirit is in dry. So my spirit is speaking but my mind is in neutral. My mind is bypassed. It's just sitting there idle. But my spirit is communicating with God. But my mind does not know what my spirit is saying. Now that sounds demonic in and of itself. Now how are you going to divorce your mind? I'm, I'm, I'm speaking. You know. But, but I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know what I'm saying. 
then how do you know what you're saying is right if you don't know what you're saying? One guy said, and he was preaching, he said, ah, when, I, when, I, when I'm praying in the spirit, I don't know what I'm saying. Well, you better know. I would suggest you know to make sure that what you're saying is correct, but you're saying that your mind is, is the one that, and then they say, well, you know, this is, I, I, I've experienced this. Your experience does not supersede the word of God. I don't care. I don't care what you experienced or what you think you experienced, but it does not supersede what thus said the word of God. God said he did not, did not give everybody the gift of speaking in tongues. So there is no, no everyone having any say. If, if everyone was an eye, where would the hearing? If everyone was an ear, where would the seeing? What if everyone was a quarterback and everyone was a wide receiver? How can we have a team if everybody is doing the same thing? Paul makes it. I, I think, you know, I ain't the sharpest razor in the bunch, but I, I think it's crystal clear. The spirit is di dislocated from the body and from the mind. But not only the problem, notice the preposition there, verse 15 and 16. Now, and it says, what is it then? <laughs> when I pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also, I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also, verse 16 says, Else when thou shalt bless, when I shall bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupy the room of the unlearned say amen, and thy giving unto thanks, seeing he understandeth not what is being said. So if you're going to sing, you make sure you sing with your reasoning is part of the process. You don't sing with your mind dislocated from your spirit. So when you sing, I'm singing a song, but my mind has no idea of what my spirit is singing. Now, I mean, that's the illustration that, that, that you get when you sing, you sing with your mind and with your spirit. When we pray, we pray with our mind and our spirit. They cannot divorce themselves from each other. One remaining idle while one is active. That, to me, that just sounds demonic. And then when they, just, just think for a moment now, when they came out of the pagan background, when they were controlled by the demons of hell, that was a separation of the body and the mind when it is demon activity. Now that's when the eyes roll back and they begin to speak in all this language. That's controlled by the devil himself. And that's why you have to be careful with this thing called yoga. Because they'll tell you you need to, to, to dislocate your body and your mind when you begin to meditate. So you have to be careful when anybody tell you that you can separate your mind from your body. To me, that's that's that that's, that 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 would scare me half to death. If I was up here preaching and my mind is in idle, it's just there and, and doing nothing, and my spirit is doing all the work, but my mind is not in, in part of the process of the reasoning of the preaching of the word. He said that's an impossibility. Purposely. Notice that it's unfruitful. It bears nothing spiritual. Not only is it purposeless, but also it's powerless. It says without meaning, it is powerless. Without understanding, it profits absolutely nothing. And he said this over and over and over again. It profits absolutely nothing. How can the unlearned say amen? Tongues that are, that are spoken correctly. There's an interpreter that comes in and interpret. But what happens if someone walks in off the street and you're speaking in some kind of unintelligible language, you're running around in the room, rolling all over the floor. When they walk in, they would think everybody in the church is crazy. They got the laughter movement now. When people come to church and they just laugh for an hour. 
They say they're controlled by God and the Holy Spirit and they're laying on the floor and they're just laughing. They say, well, that's that. Now, if someone walked in the church and everybody laying on the floor, everybody bless the whole, everybody laying on the floor and everybody just laughing, somebody walk in off the street, they're going to immediately walk out. See, everybody in there is crazy. They got where they come and bark like a dog. I'm going to bark for Jesus. <laughs> if I can pray for him, if I can worship him, I can bark for him. And Jesus wants me to bark like a dog and then come for an hour and they're sitting there barking like a dog and they're saying that they're controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know what is the Spirit, but it ain't the Holy One. That's going to tell you that God wants you to come and bark like a dog, cock your leg up, urinate on the floor like a dog, and you want to say that we're having worship. What happened if somebody come in off the street? We're all on our all four, barking like a dog. When they come in, what would they say? Or if they come in and were speaking in a language that they can't understand, how can they say amen? So more it be. How can they understand what's being said if they can't understand what's being said? How can they come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord if they can't understand what's being spoken? He said, how can he unlearn it? How can the ones from the street come in? How can they come in and say amen? How can they have any kind of understanding? Tongues for the times that are valid, but without understanding, it profits no one. Those that do not know the language, how can they agree? How can they say amen? How can they grow their faith? It's not edifying the body as a whole. It's only for their own personal satisfaction of wanting to look just a little bit more spiritual than everybody else in the congregation. Because this is what I can, can do. But not only the prescription for tongues, but notice the practice challenge there. In verse 18 and 19, Paul says that he spake with tongues more than all. But notice the personal experience there in verse 18. And he says, I thank my God that I spake with, notice now, it is not unknown tongue, singular, but it's tongues plural. That's the word delecta, more than you all. Paul says, I speak with tongues, delecta. I speak with more languages than you all. It is not talking about ecstatic utterances. It is not talking about the godly group that we hear today. Paul is saying, I speak more languages than you all. You have people today can speak five, six, seven, eight, nine. I know one guy from uh, Kenya, a classmate of mine, he can speak ten different languages. Paul is simply saying, listen, that I speak with delectos languages that which is known versus that which is unknown. Paul is referring to languages, not this godly group that we hear in the 21st century church that everyone wants to get up and speak in an unknown language but nobody's there to interpret what's being said. Paul is referring to language. He said, I am thankful that I can speak to you all. Paul has traveled the world. And everywhere Paul went, I believe Paul knew the language. Paul was a Pharisee. Paul was an educated man at the feet of Gamaliel. He was educated. I believe Paul can speak. I don't know how many, but everywhere Paul went, Paul could speak the language because it was God's miracle in his life. I simply believe that wherever he went, he can share the message of the gospel with anybody that he, any region or any language he can speak so he can share the message of the gospel. So just like if I went to China and I can speak Chinese, Japanese, I can speak Spanish, Tagalog, I can speak every language. So when I go to the Philippines, I can speak their language. This is all Paul is saying. Paul is not saying that all I, I can speak more ecstatic utterances than all of you. That's not what he's saying at all. He said I can speak in more language, not only the personal experience, but notice the practical expression in verse 19. And it says, yet in the church, your Bible say that? Your Bible say church. Church, the ecclesia, the called out one. That's where we are today. But yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding. That's me with my mind. Uh, it's connected to my spirit. Now reasoning is connected together. This is with five words with my understanding that by my voice, 
that I might teach others than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Paul said, I would rather speak five words that you can understand than 10,000 words that no one can understand. Seems to me that Paul is correct in the church at Corinth. He's not condoning them. He's not saying that this is what you ought to do. So the Pentecostal movement, I don't know where they get their information from, but they go to chapter 14 and they simply want to say that this is what Paul is saying. They don't understand, first of all, who, what, when, where, and why the letter was written to the Corinthian. Paul was writing and it was a castigating, condemning letter that he was correcting them in their actions in the church. That lets you know already this is not a letter like the letter to the church at Thessalonica when Paul commended them. He thanked them for sending the offering, for sending the money. This is not a letter of thanks. This is a letter of correction and condemning. But not only the prescription of tongues, the practice challenge, but lastly, for this time together, the problem communicated in verse 20. And it says, brethren, be not children in understanding. And that ought to be enough right there to make a Baptist shout. He says, be not children in understanding. Listen, how be it in malice, be ye children, but in understanding, be men. He said, listen, if you're going to get anything, you need to get some understanding. You better understand what you're saying. You better understand what you're doing so it can edify the body of Christ. He said, now, whatever you do, you get understanding. That's the purpose for us coming in here today. That's the purpose for me standing up here in the pulpit today is that you can understand everything that I say that you can apply to your life to make you better today than you were yesterday. That's the purpose for the church. Amen. Most folks say, well, Pastor Joel preached good today. What did he preach about? I don't know. But it was good. And, and if that's the case, and if that's true, that means you didn't apply anything to your life. See, when they say that, I know exactly what happened. They just simply regurgitated what you already know. So really, you didn't learn anything. They just say, well, he's a way making he's a bridge over troubled water. He's a battle like in the time of a battle. He do God do this. It, that's everything you already know. It just regurgitated what you know already. And that's what most preachers do every Sunday morning is tell you what you already know. They don't dissect the text and do a proper word study, exegete the text, and present it in a way that's understandable as you explain the text based on the unit of thought. The problem is pride and childish behavior. And that's all it is. Paul, he said before, when I was a child, I acted like a child. I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Paul says, when it comes to understanding, be men. But it says, in malice, be children. That word, and then, but with understanding, he said, be men. Paul again told them, and listen, they need to grow up and be men. Stop acting like little children in the church who can't get your way. Paul said you need to grow up and be men and be women in the church. This is a letter of correction. When it comes to malice or pride, we should be innocent. But when it comes to understanding, we should be men. Paul said it got to be some, some understanding. You can't stand up in front of the congregation. And everybody in the church is speaking in ecstatic utterance. Everybody in the church is speaking in tongues that no one can understand. Paul said, first of all, there better be some understanding. They go on to explain the substance of of, of tongues and we'll pick up next week with the with the last four points and we'll tie it all together and then we'll bring it home as to what these five sermons and whether or not tongues are valid in the 21st century and I simply believe based on the authority of the word of God that it is not valid for the 21st century because Paul is telling them listen that what you're doing is wrong you ought to stop he shows the comparison between that which is understood Understandable and that which is ununderstandable. Unintelligent speech and that which is intelligent. Paul makes a comparison. See, it, this is how you tell whether or not it's legitimate or not. Even though tongues are not 
valid in the 21st century church. But if it was, then there would be an interpreter and it would be interpreted. Never once in 18 years of ministry have I ever seen anyone speak in tongues. He said in the church. He made it. He made it clear. He didn't say in the arena. He said, while I'm in church, I would rather speak five words that you can understand in 10,000 that no one can understand. Paul is trying to tell the church at Corinth, listen, what you're doing is improper. It is wrong. Everybody's desiring the same gift. Everybody wanted to show off. Everybody wanted to be seen. Everybody wanted to be on the podium. Everybody wanted their names in life. And Paul said, no, the gifts are given by the Holy Spirit. And that gift that is given is the one you are to operate in. Do not come in and covet or to desire the gift. And then he gave a, an inventory of the gift. And he put prophecy first and tongues last. The last one, the least of honor is tongues. And Paul said, herein is the reason why that it's last and it's least. He said, because of what you're doing, the unknown tongue, the glossolalia, the static utterances, no one can understand what's being said. So Paul said, I put that at the bottom of the list. Paul said, except there be an interpreter. And I know that folks today are either watching this video, and I know I'm going to have some feedback, lashback. Some people might say that I'm crazy, but all you got to do is follow the word. The word is crystal clear that Paul is saying, listen, it is not valid. It is not even profitable for the body of Christ if you are to speak in the language. And he even said, if someone walk in off the street and everybody in here, is, is talking in some kind of mumbo jumbo. Somebody walk in here and think everybody in here crazy and they'll walk back out. But a lot of folks have been geared or raised up into this Pentecostal movement and it has become a part of them. But I've seen a lot of people come out of it because now they've got the true revelation. When you say, when you ask Jesus Christ to come in your life, you say that nanosecond that you ask the Holy Spirit comes into you. There is no second blessing. There is no baptism of power. It's that moment you say yes to Jesus Christ. You receive the Holy Spirit. And then you're baptized out of the obedience of Christ for what has already taken place on the inside. You're simply saying I'm, 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 I'm dead to self. Romans 6, 6 say I'm dead to self and I'm being raised in the newness of life. That's just symbolic of what I've done. And that's all it is. The salvation is based on faith and faith alone. No good standings with the church. No baptism. You can't lose your salvation. Once you're saved, you always save. But the question is, were you ever saved from the beginning? That's the question. Yeah. But if you are saved, you should always be saved. It is not something that you can lose. If God can take nothing and create everything that we see today, why is it that God cannot take our salvation and solidify it and hold it secure that he's going to keep dropping it and picking it up and dropping it and picking it up and dropping it and picking it up? No, once you're saved, you always say. Amen. 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 There's no need to open the door to the church because we all are members of the church. So we're going to move on. And have Sister Edwards come with um with our announcement. Remember, there's a service after service to Mount Sinai. Uh, everybody should know the address, how to get there for those that can make it, uh, that you could make it and make it and try to support 